This is the newsroom for Tuesday, December 9, 2020. We're broadcasting to you on E1, Scar TV, NTN, and Tarzi TV in Barteca. In the headlines, the parents of a six-day-old baby who died at the West Demerara Regional Hospital from COVID-19 is accusing health professionals of foul play. Well, now the baby in a post-martin, so now um, COVID, let me do the post-martin. I want to know how baby died. Attorney General Anil Nandlal says the government's responsibility is to its citizens first before it facilitates the influx of asylum seekers. A 19-year-old has made history in Guyana as the first helicopter pilot to have studied, trained and become certified. And in sport, regional broadcaster Alex Jordan reflects on West Indies' first test loss and looks ahead to Game 2. With the news, I'm Kurt Campbell. We're glad you can join us. First up, the parents of a six-day-old baby who died at the West Demerara Regional Hospital from COVID-19 is accusing health professionals of foul play because 16 days later, they are still awaiting a post-mortem examination to be done. The newsroom met with the family at the hospital on the west coast of Demerara on Wednesday, where they said doctors have ruled out COVID-19 as the cause of the baby's death, but they are still being pushed around after requesting an autopsy. Bibi Katoon reports. This is the West Demerara Regional Hospital where a six-day-old baby died on November 23rd. Sixteen days later, the family is still awaiting the body for burial. They are accusing the hospital staff of neglect or foul play. The newsroom spoke with the parents on Wednesday at the hospital. They have asked for their identities to be withheld. At the time, they were awaiting word on an autopsy, which was initially scheduled for Tuesday, but is yet to be done. They, 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 they tell me yesterday that the baby going to get caught today, right? Because they, they sent over the baby for caught. He's supposed to caught yesterday. They say he's going to caught yesterday. When we go over, they said no postmortem doing today come back this morning. When we go over there this morning, they say that um, no filing gone over for the baby yet. Now we try to call here, they say the file is over there. When you go, when you find out over there, no file in there. So, I, me you know what was really going on. They might tell you one thing and, 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 and when you go, it's the next thing. As far as me, they, they kill the baby and then try to cover up, what is it? I just don't know what else to say. I'm very confused because they have us pushing around, pushing around, and nobody can tell you nothing properly. When we came Friday, they told us that um, they can give us a baby to bury her, right? And then my husband told them that he wants a post-martin done. They said they're going to get the post-martin done. And, um, now, today is a different story. From Friday to now is a different story. Every day is something new. The parents explained that this is their second child. The first is three years old. The six-day-old baby was born via cesarean section on November 17th and died on November 23rd while in the neonatal intensive care unit. The Ministry of Health on November 30th said the baby died from COVID-19, but after both parents tested negative for the disease, the parents were told by officials at the West Demerara Hospital that the test for the baby was a false positive and was given the baby for burial. But the father insisted on a postmortem and said since his request, he's being pushed around. Mm -hmm. And first of all, before that, they said that it's a mishap. The test is a mishap. That it happened over at the lab officer. It mixed up. So baby clear. Then they will give me the baby for bury. And I said, no, no, no. Do postmortem on the baby. Post because they say if he COVID test is positive, he can't do postmortem. Well, now the baby in a postmortem, so now um, COVID, let me do the postmortem. I want to know how baby died. During the six days in the hospital, the mother explained that she had no sort of physical contact with her baby and nurses have been given conflicting responses about his diagnosis. 22nd November, they called me and said that. Um, Baby in doing well, like come right. When I come now, they say they have 50 50 chance. On the 23rd November, in the morning, they call and say that um, if I could come to the hospital. No, but first, before we left, then we left, he healthy. Yeah, he was healthy. Yeah, when I come to the hospital, there's a dead baby in front of me. But oh, uh, the, the night, I never had close contact, only the night before he, he died, that was the 22nd of November, 
they told me to hold them close to my heart so he could feel the heartbeat and um, I had him a little this is the first time I ever hold him because they have a yellow line in the room we can't go close, can't go close to the baby so I don't know already on the 23rd on the 23rd um. and the 23rd from there to, to now we get to nothing no satisfaction the frustrated parents are calling for a full investigation into their son's death. Chief Medical Officer Dr. Narayan Singh on Tuesday told the newsroom that as a precaution, about 12 employees who came in contact with the baby have been identified, but only some were swapped for COVID-19, and their results came back negative. The Chief Medical Officer also debunked the claims of a false COVID-19 positive and verified that the baby, who was born with a heart defect, tested positive twice for the virus after he died. As a matter of fact, the chief medical officer also noted that the baby may have contracted the dreaded virus at the West Demerara Regional Hospital. The newsroom understands that the post-mortem examination will be done on Friday morning, after which a cause of death will be determined. I am Bibi Katoon, reporting for the newsroom. We tell you now that Guyana's Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs, Anil Nandlal, on Wednesday said that Guyana's limited resources must be shared with its citizens first before migrants can be aided. He said Guyana stands ready to assist in a humanitarian way to the hundreds of Cubans looking to seek asylum in the United States, but it can only be done so based on the resources and its availability. Guyana's Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs Anil Nandlal on Wednesday reminded of the government's responsibility to its citizens to ensure that facilities exist to afford them quality standard of living before those courtesies can be extended to migrants. The Attorney General made the comments as Guyana continues to work at a diplomatic level with Suriname, Cuba and the United States on finding a solution for the hundreds of Cuban asylum seekers currently camped out at Saudi in Suriname in anticipation to use Guyana as a transshipment point to the United States of America. In an invited comment, Nandlal told the newsroom Wednesday that Guyana does not have the facilities to handle any influx of unanticipated immigrants at the moment. One has a responsibility in government to one's citizenry and the available facilities in a country and juxtapose that and weigh that against an influx of unanticipated grouping of persons that the state may not have the requisite necessities to provide for. Nandla said Guyana continues to engage at the bilateral level to assist in finding a humanitarian solution to the plight of the hundreds of Cubans in search of betterment. The AG clarified that Guyana has not outrightly rejected accepting the Cubans, but noted that several issues need to be addressed first. Uh, we are told that thousands of Cubans plan to assemble here in Guyana during the month of December either to come here to get visas at the embassy or to pass through Guyana on their way to Brazil, then via the highways of America to Mexico, where they represent themselves at the border. Now, you have a whole set of things here. The information we have is that the most of them are illegally in Suriname. The Attorney General explained that Guyana has to look at its responsibility to the country it shares its borders with, particularly with Brazil already complaining that persons have been using Guyana's poorest borders to enter the country. Nandla said that Guyana has learned that a large percentage of the Cubans in Suriname are there illegally, a matter that will also need to be addressed. He said that those persons would also have to take their COVID-19 tests in keeping with Guyana's push to control the spread of the virus here. But more importantly, he pointed out that the ferry crossing remains closed, prohibiting travel between Guyana and Suriname via the Quarantine River. Guyana, as you know, is a poor country with limited resources. We have problems in providing essential goods and services for Guyanese. 
we are operating in a pandemic that we have not been able to control at a level that we would like to. We have porous borders and we are required to police those borders. We are not an island but a mainland. It means that we share borders with other countries and we owe responsibilities and duties to those countries. Nandla said Guyana is also taking into account allegations of people smuggling, trafficking in persons, allegations that he says the government must react to. Nanda said Guyana will continue to work with its partners and hope to remedy the situation in the best possible way. Minister of Foreign Affairs and, and International Cooperation Yu Tud on Monday met with Cuban Ambassador to Guyana to discuss the issue. The meeting occurred on the same day that Guyana authorities announced the postponement of the reopening of the Molson Creek crossing to stave off the scores of Cubans camping out at South Drain in Suriname who are desirous of entering Guyana. The foreign ministry in Suriname said it has requested technical assistance from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the Red Cross and the International Organization for Migration. President Irfan Ali has called on Region 2 housing officials to immediately address the claims of false receipts issued for the sale of house lots to residents in the region. Residents on Wednesday raised several concerns with the president and his team during an outreach at the Regional Democratic Council in Anna Regina, Region 2. The regional housing clerk explained that she became aware of the matter when she joined the department in 2018. She said housing officers were allocating lots to persons and were collecting the monies. These payments, she noted, were not being deposited to the RDC accounts department. The lots in question are located primarily in the Lima Sands community. Chief Executive Officer of the Central Housing and Planning Authority, Sherwin Greaves, who was also present at the outreach, stated that after the issue was brought to his attention, he terminated the employment of the previous regional housing officer, Ruben Henry. Meanwhile, the president announced that an additional 600 house lots will be developed and distributed to residents in several Region 2 communities. The head of state explained that plans for the development of the 600 house lots will be completed within weeks, while the infrastructural work will be initiated by mid next year. The areas identified for the house lots are Charity and Lima Sands. When the newsroom returns, the movie theaters in Guyana are calling on the government to allow them to reopen, and a 19-year-old makes history in Guyana by becoming the first certified helicopter pilot. Stay with us. You're watching the newsroom. Caribbean cinemas and movie towns say they are extremely disappointed with the latest government order to extend the closure of movie theaters in the country until December 31st, 2020. The newsroom on Wednesday spoke with proprietor of the Giftland Mall, Mr. Roy Bipat, who noted that Caribbean Cinemas has put all COVID-19 measures in place to protect patrons. Bibi Katoon reports. Since March 2020, all movie theaters were closed to stop the spread of COVID-19. Almost nine months later, these facilities remained closed and their staff unemployed. Movie Tong, which opened in 2019, and the Giftland Mall, which opened in 2015 along with the Princess Hotel, are the three facilities with theatres here. The newsroom spoke with Mr. Roy Bipat, the proprietor for the Giftland Mall, who explained that all systems are in place for the reopening of its movie theatres in keeping with COVID-19 guidelines. Bipat said he is prepared to accommodate less than 50% of the persons at the movie theatres if permission is granted. Like Caribbean cinemas the, um, and Giftland Mall, a very secured covid free environment because we sanitize. Um, we make sure that the protocols are, are followed, that people wear masks. And Caribbean Cinemas even has more stringent regulations than Giftland Mall. So therefore, were they be, to be allowed to be reopened, they would only be open at 35% capacity. If you're sitting here where I am, nobody, unless you're, they're a family member, would be allowed within six feet of you. So you're not going to go in there and be breaking any COVID regulation. And when you finish and you leave, they will sanitize the chair and make sure it's ready for the next customer. The only time that you will be allowed to take off your mask is if you're having a snack. He explained that Caribbean cinemas employ approximately eight staff to manage eight theaters and provide other services. BPAT pointed out that the franchise holders have reopened their theaters in other Caribbean countries and the United States. He said they have not had any positive COVID-19 cases since. 
As such, he's pleading with the authorities to reconsider their current position on the issue. We're appealing to um, Dr. Frank Anthony and the Honorable Prime Minister to really look at this. We, we've made many representations, but they really no, need to look at this seriously because it is a decision that's affecting many people's lives. Many people are on the bread line. And if you can people allow people in a bus, a bus is much more unsafe than a cinema. Are you going to stop everybody going in a bus? You know, where do you draw the line? Where, where is this decision being made? What is the rationale being used? Caribbean Cinemas has all their workers out of employment since March. It is not fair for them, and it is not fair for the Guyanese public that want a little entertainment, a little relaxation, to be able to come and enjoy themselves in a very safe environment. In the emergency measures for December, minibuses and other public transportation are allowed to carry 100% of its capacity. Restaurants and tourist lodges are also allowed to open. Cinemas in Guyana have been closed since March 26, 2020, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The newsroom was not able to interview someone from Movie Tongue, but that mall has also put systems in place to protect patrons. In a video on its Facebook page, Movie Tongue indicated that various signs have been erected to ensure that persons wear their masks, wash their hands, and adhere to social distancing guidelines. Bibi Katun, reporting for the newsroom. We tell you now that at 19 years of age, Captain Azam Ali has made history as the first helicopter pilot to have studied, trained, and successfully completed his check ride and be licensed as a private helicopter pilot in Guyana. On Wednesday, he was recognized for his achievements by the government of Guyana. Here is more. At 19 years old, Captain Azam Ali has made history in Guyana by becoming the first locally trained and certified helicopter pilot. Ali, who is currently employed with Air Services Limited, was honored for his accomplishment during a simple ceremony on Wednesday by the Ministry of Public Works. He was presented with his license by Public Works Minister Juan Edgel to operate and fly helicopters, which were certified by the Guyana Civil Aviation Authority. Edgel also presented Ali with a personal letter of commendation, noting that he is now an inspiration to all young Guyanese professionals. The task is mine this afternoon to recognize publicly what I would want to call as an inspiration to all our young Guyanese professionals. Somebody might want to ask why we're making such a big fuss. We could have called him to my office and just give him the letter and the plaque and he could have gotten, gone over to GCA, signed and picked up his license. But when people do well, we must give them flowers while they can appreciate it. The young captain also received a plaque for his accomplishments by Minister Edgel. Ali, in brief comments, expressed appreciation for the support he received from his family and Air Services Limited. I just want to say uh, thank you for this uh, honor. I feel very honored to uh, receive it. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you to uh, Captain Mazhar Ali for giving me this opportunity. Without him, I could have never accomplished what I did today. Uh, there's also a lot of people that helped me along my way. In 2019, Ali began working in the Aircraft Maintenance Department of Air Services Limited as a trainee aircraft mechanic, after which he was then assigned to the Rotocraft Maintenance Program, which provided him with the foundational knowledge of Rotocraft Maintenance. In 2020, upon completion of one year in maintenance, he was given the opportunity by Captain Mazahar Ali to begin training as a helicopter pilot. His training commenced on August 3, 2020, under the tutelage of Captain Buddy Chance, a veteran helicopter pilot and one of two approved helicopter flight instructors at Air Services Limited. His initial flight training was done on the Robinson R-66 helicopter, and on September 3, 2020, he did his first solo flight. This was followed on December 8, 2020 by his private pilot check ride with Captain Chris Kirkaldi of the Guyana Civil Aviation Authority, which was successful. President Irvin Ali on Wednesday announced that more than $5 billion will be invested in Region 2, Pomeroon, Supinam. The president made the announcement during his presidential outreach. Some of the major investments in the pipeline include the construction of a water treatment plant, additional power generating capacity for the region, the implementation of a $50 million road program, the commencement of a 70 million sea defense program, distribution of more than 4,500 cash grants 
and the rehabilitation of 50 miles of drainage and irrigation infrastructure. The head of state said that the main aim of this visit is to resolve many of the issues faced by residents, which he noted are resolvable. In this regard, he pointed to the importance of the exercise and the potential impact it will have on the lives of the beneficiaries. The president also announced that a rapid response team will be set up to address the concerns of residents in the swiftest possible manner. More news ahead. Stay with us. You're watching the newsroom. As part of the Canada-founded Juris Project, the Supreme Court is looking to address public trust in the court system. The court on Wednesday launched a public education and engagement campaign, which is being rolled out virtually due to the COVID-19 pandemic. During the launch, director of the project, Gloria Richards Johnson, noted that the crisis of the confidence in the courts need to be addressed to provide greater legitimacy to the courts, but also to protect them from political exploitation. Chancellor of the Judiciary, Justice Yonet Cummings Edwards, said the court's duty have become more tedious with the onset of COVID-19, but all efforts were made to ensure access to justice is not delayed or denied. The systemic and responsible engagement of the public provides an important means not only to provide greater legitimacy to the courts, but also to protect them from political exploitation. The possibility of shutting out the public voice or placating it seems to be the least effective as well as the least creative way of responding to the crisis of confidence in the courts. Whenever anything changes the ability of the courts to hear any matter that concerns our citizens, their families, their property, their business, or their relationships, or even the state, the courts must find a way to respond quickly, safely, and efficiently. The COVID-19 pandemic is one such event. It was a great onslaught on every institution. The courts were not spared. Unprecedented in modern era, the COVID-19 pandemic potentially sought to disrupt the delivery of justice to our citizens. As we work to keep the wheels of justice turning through the use of Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Skype, GoToMeeting, and other online platforms, there was immediately evident the need to ensure that citizens were aware of this fact. There was the need for citizens to be aware also that their access to justice was not compromised and that the work of the court was ongoing. The judiciary had implemented a campaign titled, We Can Still Hear You, and for the first time, the court live streamed some of its hearings on YouTube, including those related to the 2020 elections petition and other landmark cases. According to Chief Justice Acting Robson George, legal practitioners have been engaging the public via radio and television programs. The government of Guyana has begun procuring refrigerators to store its COVID-19 vaccine and are now developing a training manual to administer the two doses of the injections. Health Minister Dr. Frank Anthony, in his daily COVID-19 update on Wednesday, stated that the systems are required for the release of the vaccines once approved from the Global Alliance for Vaccines. And Guyana has long had a stringent immunization program for children. The minister said dealing with adults will require more stringent systems in place. Um, we have already started to do some work in this area um, because we, we have to uh, develop a vaccine pre uh, preparedness plan. So we have um, worked on a draft uh, plan. And in addition to that, uh, we have started working with COVAX uh, to submit um, some of the things of, about possible vaccine candidates and um, our preferences. So those um, things have gone into COVAX uh, about preferences that we will have for vaccines. And at the same time, we have also started to look at our cold chain, the places where we are going to store vaccine. Um, we are working on expanding some of these centers to ensure that we have adequate space. And we have um, started the procurement process to get uh, the types of refrigerators that would be necessary for the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, we have also started uh, developing a training manual and that would then be used to train persons uh, to administer the vaccine. 
as you know, this vaccine is a two-dose vaccine, and, um, and therefore, once people get the first dose, they'll have to come back in some cases three weeks, depending on the vaccine that we're using, either three weeks or a month to get the, the second dose. So these are all things that we are uh, working out and to ensure that once we have the vaccine in place, that we can quickly roll it out. The Ministry of Health on Wednesday recorded 32 new COVID-19 cases from 385 tests, taking Guyana's overall number of confirmed cases to 5,732. Region 6 recorded the majority of the new cases with a total of 17 new cases. Regions 2 and 8 recorded one case each, while Region 3 recorded two new cases and Region 4, 11 new cases. There are 638 patients in home isolation, 47 in institutional isolation, and five patients are in the COVID-19 intensive care unit at the Infectious Diseases Hospital Liliendal East Coast, Demerara. An additional 32 persons who came into contact with positive patients are in institutional quarantine. To date, 154 persons have died from the dreaded disease. When the newsroom returns, the financial weather and bridge reports along with sport. Welcome back to the newsroom. Now for a look at what's happening in sport. We start things off with some cricket news. Host New Zealand inflicted their largest margin of victory in West Indies in the first test, which lasted four days. The newsroom's Akin Green spoke with broadcaster Alex Jordan to get her insight as to where things went wrong for the Caribbean side and how they can possibly rebound in the second and final test, starting Thursday evening. All right, Alex, uh, not the best of performance from West Indies in that first test. A massive defeat, uh, five consecutive uh, test losses in New Zealand. Now, uh, what did you make of it? Boy, it was tough. New Zealand's biggest ever test win against the West Indies. It was hard to watch, of course. But, you know, <laughs> you look at that test match and really it's the same thing. It's the same thing we've been struggling with for years, which is, our batting is not good enough, and especially the top order, those top four batsmen. Craig Brathwaite, John Campbell, Darren Bravo, Shamar Brooks. Those four men need to give us more runs. The first innings combined, they scored 57 runs. The second innings combined, they scored 26 runs. In case our viewing public is not great at maths, that is 83 runs combined for the two innings, for the top four, well, we can't win a, we, we can't even start a test match. If there was any good thing, and, and I think this is the mind boggling thing by a lot of fans, Alex, is that how come Jermaine Blackwood and Alzari Joseph uh, were able to apply themselves? We know there were some chances, but we, both of them, one of them got 100, and one of them, you know, was close to scoring 100. There were some chances. Ross Taylor put down a Jermaine Blackwood, a fairly, fairly straightforward catch up for a slip, but yeah, I mean, I don't know how to explain that. Jermaine Blackwood's been having a great year. Let's remember, he had um, some good innings against England and he also had a pretty good CPL. He, he's loving his batting right now. And we know Alzari Joseph, I, I think we would have to say, is a genuine all-rounder at this stage. And, and remember, too, this was sort of the back end of the second innings. There wasn't a ton of pressure. We had lost the test match. So perhaps they felt a little um, less pressure in the approach to their innings. Um, you know, Jermaine Blackwood in his press conference talked about the fact that actually he started a little too sort of furiously. And then when he realized Alzari was there to back him, he's like, you know what, I need to really take my time. The test match cricket is not easy cricket. You know, you have to face a lot of balls. You have to spend a lot of time out there. And I think that the difference right now, it's not quality. We have quality batsmen. We know that they can play cricket and they have a uh, good technique and, uh, you know, all of these guys now at least 30 test matches in. I mean, these guys have a, a fair amount of um, uh, experience behind them. The issue is discipline. It's discipline and it's difficult, right? I mean, when we watch New Zealand in the field, every ball counts. Every ball that they're facing, every ball they bowl, every ball they feel, every ball they catch, they place a premium on it. And I think still, we're still a little too casual. Don't leave alone enough balls. I, I was pleased with the time in the middle, especially in the first innings. In top order, they, they spent a lot of time out there. Couldn't get, couldn't get many runs on the board. But 
You know, I don't know if this speaks to something bigger too, because people should be challenging their men for the top spots on the West Indies team. Some of the guys who I think on numbers in the Caribbean region and, and the tournament would merit a space because, you know, they would have done well. Their numbers still don't inspire confidence that they can go at the test level and do better than what is happening right now. And I think that is a big issue. It is. It's, it's a struggle. And it's going to be a real struggle for West Indies in the second test. If you think about it, we have it was an innings and 134 run defeat with our top bowling lineup. Well, now we lost Kamar Roach, um, um, you know, and uh, Shane Dowrich is out. We don't know about Hetty. We don't know about Kimo Paul. Now the batsmen really have to do their jobs because uh, if, if the, the beating was so bad with, with our most experienced bowlers in the lineup, now that we have lost them for the second test, here is the opportunity for the batsmen to get in the middle and show us what they're worth. And, and for this test, finally, what, obviously there's an enforced change with two of them. As a matter of fact, with Kimar Roach and Shane Dorich out, you know, what is your test 11 looking like? Boy, that's a tough one right now. I get, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, Joshua De Silva and his inclusion. I mean, obviously, he's coming in as a replacement wicket keeper, and we've seen that he's got some quality with the bat. Um, I, I particularly like Joshua De Silva's resolve. You see, I think this is the thing differentiating West Indies from the rest of the world it's a mental resolve, it's not physical. It's not technical. It's an emotional and mental willingness to bat it out. And we saw um, Joshua De Silva uh, made 133 not out and a 56 not out er earlier in the year in Manchester on the West Indies Tour, the warm-up match. So an opportunity for him. And in some ways, I think, for people making their debut and for sort of younger players, here's an opportunity. It's not like the team is doing really well and you get an opportunity. The team is struggling. Here is your chance. Um, to step up and, 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 and do something for this second test. Boy, I don't know. I don't know if we have a, much of a choice in terms of our 11. We've got we to use who's fit at this stage with four men um, with, well, out, potentially, uh, and see what we can do. I don't expect, of course, a victory <laughs> in this second test, but I think that all that West Indian fans uh, and cricket fans can expect around the world is a better batting performance from this side. We tell you now that leadership and discipline are two key areas of New Zealand's success in Test cricket recently. That's the view of West Indies assistant coach Roddy Estwick. The world number two ranked Test nation defeated West Indies by an innings and 134 runs in the opening Test in Hamilton. But Estwick said the players are keen on fighting to avoid a series sweep. Well, you have to adjust quickly. Obviously, the pitches are very, very good. Um, like Shannon said, the, 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 the ball is completely different. Um, but also New Zealand are a very disciplined side. You know, a lot of the other sides in the world will, will try and go hard at you and you have more chances. But when you look at New Zealand, they, they discipline all, all the way through. They leave the world well. And anybody that comes to New Zealand, you know, they, you know you're in for a very, very tough series and a very, very tough game because they've got the, they've got the, the game where they want it and, and they, they, they unit. They, you know, you can see it. You can see it off the field. You can see it on the, on the field. They, 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 they were led, but they also have a lot of leaders within that group, you know. So that takes some pressure off Kane as well, because when you look, you, you see Saudi leading the, 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 the bowling group, and you see Ross lead, leading the batting group. So there's a, there's a core of, of very experienced players who, who, who lead the side well, and that's, that's what we're aiming for, you know, that you have leaders all around the park. Good sides will have leaders. I didn't say captains. You need leaders. That, that takes pressure off the captain and that can help. If people are not um, pulling the weight, then the captain or the management have to, don't have to deal with it. Somebody in the, um, the group, you know, the, the leading group will, will, ha will have a quiet word and they will know the culture of the cricket and that's what sets New Zealand apart from most teams. You have to have honest and open discussions. This, this, is, this is test cricket, it's a, it's a test of everything, your, your, your physical, your mental, everything. So we, we, we've had discussions, with, now it's, like Jason said earlier um, in the interview, the talking has to stop. We have to go out now and, and stay in the contest, stay in the fight, because you know New Zealand is going to be up for the fight. We've got to be ready. Um, the game in, 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 in Hamilton is gone. We've got to look forward to this one in Wellington. And we're representing 8 million people back in the West Indies. And we've got to, they want to see us fight and we've got to be prepared to fight. We just can't roll over and say, well, New Zealand is a good side. We're not going to fight and we're going to 
lay down and let it run all over us. We've got to be, we've just got to stay in the fight, stay in the contest. And once we can stay in the contest, you know, you've got a chance, but you've got to be prepared to work hard. Football News Now local-based Golan Jaguars players and members of the management team have been tested for the coronavirus and according to President of the Ghana Football Federation, Wayne Ford, they are very satisfied with the results. However, the players are yet to return to training as the Federation is yet to receive permission for sessions to resume. No doubt we're going to have to retest the players because of the time that um, has elapsed from the last time they were tested. So that is a completely different undertaking that we will have to accommodate as we continue to plan for the resumption of national team training. As it, with regards to the preparation of the local players, we await the approval of the COVID-19 task force and once that approval is granted, we will commence training um, once the testing and all the other protocol that is part of the plan that was submitted to the task force um, um, had been um, implemented. So it is pretty much a waiting game here for us, but we feel that once we are given the approval, we are ready to um, commence the preparation of the um, local base national team players. We are very concerned um, about the fact that we are unable to put the guys back on the pitch. They've essentially been inactive for the better part of a year. And given the importance and the quality of competition we will be coming up against um, this year, it is critical that we get those guys back on the pitch. So we're paying careful attention to the situation and we're hoping to make the best possible decisions once the approval is granted. Meanwhile, CONCACAF has confirmed the schedule for the eagerly anticipated regional qualifiers for the FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022. World governing body FIFA has announced that certain international match windows will be extended to enable confederations to schedule triple match dates. This is due to the challenges faced by global football due to COVID-19, in particular for those regions where several 2020 FIFA international match windows were suspended. In CONCACAF's case, FIFA's decision means that the Confederation can schedule three matches in each of the September and October 2021 and January and March 2022 FIFA international match windows. This will enable CONCACAF to begin its eight-team final round of the CONCACAF qualifiers in September 2021, following a first round played in March and June 2021 and a second round in June 2021, which will also include two FIFA international match windows. The draw for the CONCACAF qualifiers for FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022 took place in August 2020 and with the certainty provided by FIFA's decision regarding the triple windows, CONCACAF can now confirm the schedule. Guyana's Golden Jaguars have been drafted in Group F alongside Trinidad and Tobago, St. Kitts and Nevis, the Bahamas and Puerto Rico. And with that, we've come to the end of the news for this evening. My name is Avanash Ramzan. Thanks for watching.